today's lesson, we're, uh, after Zach's heroic efforts to get us caught back up, we're about a lesson behind again. So we're on lesson 13, and we're going to try to finish um, what we didn't get to last week, which was uh, the rest of Elihu's uh, speeches to Job. I think this is really important because what Elihu is talking about is going to set the stage for what God is going to talk about coming up. So it's really important for us to go through this part. And um, I think what Elihu says helps answer some of our questions that we've been having. And it also then, again, what God continues to say through the next two lessons are going to be really valuable to us. So um, if you could turn to Job chapter 34, and that's where we'll be at today. Job chapter 34. And before we start, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Our dearest Father in heaven, we thank you for this time together to be as a class together and to open your word. Father, we would ask that you help us to think about the things that are said this morning, that we might think about the knowledge and wisdom contained in your word, that we might be better prepared to, to understand what it means to suffer and to understand the reasonings for suffering and to understand that your ways are so much mightier than ours and that your control of the that the world is in your control and father we are so grateful that we have someone that loves us so much that cares so much about us that is in control of this world and father we know that all things are in your power and we ask and pray that you would help us to understand better just that we might be better stewards of the gifts that you have given us and the time and the abilities that we have, that we might be better prepared to be your servants on this earth, that we might be your children here, shining that light to the community, to those around us, to, to show them a better way and to give them the hope that we have. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we go through this class together, that we would say the right things and, and, and just grow together continually, always. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. It's in Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so Job 34. So if you remember back in uh, Job 32, we were introduced to Elihu. Um, after Job's uh, friends have inaccurately explained to God and how God runs the world, uh, Elihu is going to teach Job instead and the audience that are there about who God really is. In his first speech, Elihu declares that God speaks through suffering, teaching us to look uh, to God and to, to keep us from falling in the pit. Remember we talked about that? Why do we suffer? There's a reason for suffering. Suffering can be um, instructive to us. It can give us instruction it's to help us to stop us from falling into that pit. And, you know, the example of touching the hot stove we didn't feel that pain from, from touching the hot stove, we'd probably touch it again and again. Um, similar thing with, with the sufferings that we face. Uh, suffering is to be considered a grace of God because suffering is something that awakens our attention to eternal considerations. That's something that we don't often think about is, are we grateful for suffering? Usually we're not very grateful for suffering. We don't want to, we don't want to experience suffering. We don't want to be grateful for suffering. But yet suffering can have value. Suffering can be something that uh, teaches us and catches our attention for certain. Uh, the answer of Job's three friends, though, is way too simplistic. We can't look at suffering and assume just because someone's suffering that they've sinned. And that's what Job's friends have done. Uh, God allows suffering in this world to awaken our spiritual attention so that we would seek the Lord. I think there's truth in that. If there wasn't suffering, people would be far less likely to try to figure out who God is. People would probably care a lot less about who God is. But because of suffering, that does tend to awaken people. Uh, Elihu ends his first speech asking Job to respond. So at the end of chapter 33, verse 32, you see, he, Elihu asks Job, what's your answer? But as we see in chapter, going into chapter 34, Job doesn't answer. Job has no response. He has nothing to say. So now Elihu will make his second speech, and, and he's going to try to teach Job uh, how his words were wrong. And that's where we had started with last week. So we got to 34. We read verses 1 through 9. Um, the first six verses, Elihu again declares that his contentions with what Job said. He doesn't seem to care whether Job has actually sinned or not. He doesn't seem to know. But his issue is more with what Job has said because he doesn't have the knowledge that his, that his friends did. Well, his friends didn't seem to have much knowledge either. But... <laughs> um, 
Elihu will challenge Job because of what he said. And he calls wise men to listen to him. And in verses 5 through 6, we'll notice again that he quotes Job. For Job has said, I am in the right, and God has taken away my right. In spite of my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. So that was him. Uh, that's, that's, that's Job's attitude, at least, of, uh, of his situation. Job feels that he's righteous, and we agree, Job is righteous. That's what it tells us in chapters 1 and 2. Um, but it doesn't seem like, to Job at least, that Job is getting what he deserves. Right? If he's righteous, based on what his friends have said, then that means that you're, you're, you're good, and you get blessed, and you get all these wonderful things from God. And since that clearly hasn't happened, Job's friends have concluded, well, you must be a sinner. And that's what he said. No, that's wrong. That's the wrong view. But So Job is aware of that. Job knows that he's not a sinner. He knows what's happening to him isn't just, at least in his eyes, but he doesn't know why. Um, yeah, his wound is incurable, though he is without transgression. So this is the, the contention we talked about last week um, about Elihu, whether Elihu is being fair to Job, if he's quoting him inaccurately, taking him out of context. He definitely has, I will say, Elihu's attitude towards Job is one that's more aggressive. <laughs> he's definitely hitting him hard on what he has said. Whether or not Job actually means that, or that's just something that Job said, or something that's out of context, is a, is a bit of a fair point. Um, uh, in, in uh, let's see, verse 9, that was the big one that we talked about. For he said, it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. And Elihu definitely has an issue with that. And uh, as we talked about, he's talking about wicked people. Wicked people say that, and that is true. But whether it's uh, whoever says it, the, the attitude is, is a wrong attitude. Uh, for he says, it's profited a man nothing that he should take delight in God. The attitude, the idea behind that is, if you do great things and you do good and you're a wonderful person and you suffer, and if you do wicked things and evil things and you're a terrible person and you suffer, what's the value? Why do good things when you could do evil things and get the same result? Does that seem like a, a sensible conclusion? It's certainly a humanly conclusion to that, right? What's wrong with that attitude? Promise of God, okay, for sure. Doesn't count eternity, right? It's very short-sighted. It's very focused on, on, this, on this earth. Um, we can look and see what Elihu says in verses 7 and 8. He says, having that attitude, you're acting and speaking like a wicked person when you say these things. And if you look at verse 36, he says the same thing again. He accuses Job of acting like wicked men with that attitude. And certainly that attitude is a wicked attitude. Um, the words Allah he quotes Job saying are particularly important. And that's back to the whole reason we've been talking about Job. That that was Satan's accusation, remember, at the beginning? Does, do people, does Job serve you for, for not? Does he serve you because he just serves you? Or does he serve you because you bless him? And that was Satan's accusation. If you don't bless Job, he's not going to serve you anymore. That was the whole heart. And that's the question, again, for each of us. And if we have that kind of attitude of, of why bother, then that's the wicked attitude. Um, yeah, Job has said there's no profit in serving God. So Eli's point is, Job is wrongly accusing God of not rewarding those who are obedient to him. And we talked about again. There's a difference between on this earth and there's a difference between eternity. Uh, and that's what Elihu is going to talk about now in the rest of this chapter, starting in verse, in verse 10. So that's kind of a little bit of an introduction, kind of hopefully run through what we talked about last week real quick. Um, anybody have any comments on that before we move on? Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, pick up in verse 10, and let's see. I don't think I'm going to read this passage in interest of time. Um, hopefully you read it last week. Um, first off, how would you describe God's character? Simple question for you. Sorry? Omniscient? Yes? Anybody else? Just. Specifically important to today's lesson. His, his character is just. His character is righteous. And that was the one I was trying to get at. 
So how does God view wickedness? Is God capable of wickedness? I think that would contradict with the character of just, right? If God performed wickedness, then it'd be pretty easy to say that he's not just. So I think those two things are in direct opposition. A wicked God can't be a just God. God is just without exception. Uh, God cannot do wickedness and he cannot do wrong. Chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to the work of a man, he will repay. And according to his ways, he will make, make it befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly and the Almighty will not pervert justice. That was verses 10 through 12. God's character requires justice. And because of that, he's going to see justice fulfilled. He's not going to pervert justice. Um, so how does that relate to Elihu's, to Job's attitude, to Elihu's attitude? What does that mean if God is just? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, so if, if God is just... God is omniscient. God is in control. We talk about God being in control of this world. Nothing happens in this world that's not subject to God's power, and yet we see wickedness happen in this world. So how do we reconcile those two things? Yeah. Yeah. It's to, it's to have that, that, that faith that God's justice will be fulfilled. And this is what Job is struggling with right now, right? Because Job's idea is, I'm just, I'm righteous, terrible things are happening to me, such to the point I'm, I'm about to die, and when I'm dead, I'm dead. So how is that righteous? How is that justice? That's the whole point that he's struggling with. Bob? Yeah. Right. Right. God is long suffering with us and he's patient with us and he wants us to not be wicked. He wants the wickedness to end, but yet he says vengeance will be his. He's going to repay the injustice. He's going to resolve that situation. And that's something that at least for Job is difficult to understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah, certainly if, uh, if God forced us to always be good all the time and not to be wicked, there would be no wickedness in the world. But we wouldn't have a choice. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have that. Um, and that's, God gives us that, that choice. We're going to talk about it a little more as we go on. Um, that's this, this whole topic we're talking about, this is what the focus of today's lesson is and, and next week's lesson. So we're going to come back to that point again about how could a righteous God allow this to happen. Uh, but before we get into that, verses 13 through 15, Elihu is going to talk a little bit more about God's character. Um, God is sovereign and he answers to no one, verses 13 through 15. So does that mean God owes us an answer? If does that mean that God owes us an answer, owes me an answer? If God answers to no one, he certainly doesn't owe David McCoy an answer for his, for his actions. And think about that, because that's, as a human failing, that's one of the things that we, that we mess up, right? God, yeah, I understand you know things, and you're, you're great, and you're all-powerful, and this righteousness is going to happen, but what about this, this thing I care about right now? What is your answer? Why did you not fix that problem? Right? God, if you're really just, then what you just allowed to happen cannot, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fit my understanding. So what's the answer to me? How do you answer me, God? And that's putting us in a position to demand an answer of God. God does not owe us an answer. Um, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have an answer for us, but he doesn't owe us an answer. 
We're not in the position to tell God what is just and what is not just. And that's, that's a difficult one, right? When we see what goes on, we think, God, if you had just healed this person, then everything would be great. Why didn't you do that, God? God, if you had just allowed this criminal to be caught, everything would be great. Why did you not do that? We want to put our sense of justice and say, and judge God by that sense of justice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the, one of the things that, we're gonna, that, that Job is trying to help us with that struggle, right? Because how often have we had something in our lives that we have just prayed and prayed about and we don't see it getting changed? We don't see it getting fixed. We don't see that answer that we wanted to have happen. Does that mean God didn't hear us? Does that mean that God doesn't care about us? Does that mean that God, like, oh, that's a minor thing, like, get over it? You know, that, or, 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 is, or is there something greater there? And we want that answer on our terms. We want that answer the way, we want God to answer the question the way I want it answered. Yeah, God knows what's best for us. Yeah. 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 And that's the whole thing about trusting in God. Do we really trust God to be controlled? And that's one of the themes that's going to keep coming up in today's lesson. Um, that's, that's super important. And this is back to God's sovereignty, that God, God is in control of all things. He knows all things. He's sovereign over all things. Why would he not know what's best? Um, that's what Elihu is going to keep talking about, verses 16 through 19. Can we condemn God who is righteous and mighty? Just because we don't get the answer that we want, that we want, is that a, per, a reason to condemn God? Uh, can we challenge God, who shows no partiality, since all people are made with His hands? Think about it. every person is formed from God. God has created us all. So why would a loving God that creates us all not care about us all? Why would He not be just? That also doesn't make sense. He shows no partiality when he created us, so why would that give one of us a better opinion of righteousness versus someone else? Why is my opinion of righteousness better than someone else's? Why is my opinion of righteousness better than God's opinion of righteousness? Um, God sees all that is going on and knows what is happening, verses 21 through 25. For his eyes are on the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps, there is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. For God has no need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. He shatters the mighty without investigation and sets others in their place. Thus, knowing their works, he overturns them in the night and they are crushed. So again, talking about God's knowledge. How would you compare that with, with what Job's accusation was against God or what Job was, um, his attitude towards God? Hmm? He hasn't turned against God. That's true. But what was his attitude towards um, his towards his righteousness? Right? He th he felt he was righteous, but how did he view God's view of his righteousness? That was his question, right? He's like, God, you must not be aware of my righteousness, or or there's something wrong at least, right? Because I am righteous. So God, you're either not aware or you're hyper-focused on my sins. Um, well, the comparison made here is that God's aware of all of us. He's aware of every man. He doesn't have to go launch a formal inquiry or investigation. I don't have to go do a fact-finding mission to find out if Job, you're righteous or not. He knows everything you've done, Job. He knows everything I've done. He knows whether my righteousness is true or not. And he talks about um, you know, someone that's wicked, he can determine that immediately when the wickedness is done, and he can crush them in the night. It doesn't require a lengthy process or a tribunal or something to be launched. God knows. Um, Bob? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so the, the, the first thing for us to accept here, and we're going to hit this next week harder when God is talking, but the first thing for us to note is that God is aware. God is aware of everything. Back to him being all-knowing, right? God knows when injustice has been done to us. God knows when someone has done something wrong to us. God knows when there's wickedness in the world. He knows when good things have been done. So all these things are within his knowledge, and all these things don't, don't escape him. He knows about all of it. Um, God know, does know what's going on, and he does see what's happening in Job's life, and the same applies to us. Uh, but Job's indication, at least, was that God must not know about the injustice he's experienced, that he's suffering, and that all this seems wrong. Someone needs to inform God so that he can get vindicated for that suffering. That was kind of Job's attitude. But God does know. Uh, therefore, Elihu asserts that God is just against the wicked and will eventually deal with them, verses 26 through 30. So the whole point is, these wicked people are not going to escape. They're going to see justice fulfilled. But maybe Elihu doesn't know how, and certainly Job didn't know how. Um, but he knew it would be, it would be fulfilled. Uh, God hears the cries of the suffering and will act on their behalf. And verse 33 there specifically is very important. Will he then make repayment to suit you because you reject it? For you must choose and not I, therefore declare what you know. What's that getting at there? What's verse 33 talking about? In terms of God's righteousness. God's will be done. Does his righteousness have to suit us? Doesn't matter what we think or say about it. Yeah. God's going to do what he knows. Right. A, a God that's all knowing and is aware of every wickedness that's been committed on this world, his righteousness is going to be fulfilled. But does he owe us an answer if his righteousness doesn't suit us? If his answer doesn't fit our expectation? If his repayment of wickedness doesn't meet our expectation. Yeah. You're right. And and because he knows that's the just thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um it's back to again when we, we see wickedness in the world, right? I see some ruler who's very wicked and treating people very poorly, and yet he seems to prosper, right? How do I, how do I reconcile that, right? To me, I want to say, God, you know, where are you? Why haven't you fixed the problem? Why haven't you gotten rid of this guy? Why haven't you done something about this, this wickedness, right? Does God owe an answer to me to suit my view of what should be righteous, what should be done? Yeah. I mean, bad things happen to good people all the time. You see it in our society. And you have people question God, why has this happened to me? Yeah. God has reserved the day of judgment for all of us. Yeah. And one day's not coming for us, is it? Yeah, right. And that's uh, certainly when we get to the New Testament, we talk about the day of judgment coming. We know righteousness will be fulfilled then. Um, certainly true. And that's when the ultimate righteousness will be fulfilled. But it's still. We're talking about like the, the struggles we see, the wickedness in the world around us. Yeah. Who am I to demand this question? Yeah. There's a better way of thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Yeah. Who am I to demand an answer? And again, think about that scenario. I mean, I see this ruler out here that's prospering and he's torturing people. He's doing bad things. And I know that he's wicked. And I know what he's doing is against the scriptures. I know it's not right. God, why haven't you fixed that? I mean, think about the situation in like China where we see a lot of oppression against people that want to worship God. We know that that's wrong. We know that there's wickedness in there. God, why haven't you fixed that? Why haven't you solved that problem? Right? To me, that, you know, that, that's a huge struggle. But then we think about it. Well, who am I to demand an answer to God for that question? And the other thing is, I don't know hardly anything about anything. <laughs> Who am I to demand this answer from God, right? 
it puts God in such a small, tiny box that you need to go conform to Dave's view of the world and his view of problems that exist and fix that one problem that's there. And I'm try- you're trying to put so much constraint around how God's to operate. And the whole point that Elihu's making here is God is so much bigger than that. He's so much greater than that. How does a God that knows every bit of wickedness in the world not aware of how to properly fix that problem or how to have righteousness fulfilled? And again, I go back to the example of China. And I, like I said, I don't know. I don't know why God allows that kind of situation to continue. But like when we were there, the fervor in people that were worshiping God was pretty intense because of that suffering. And maybe that's God's way to encourage people to be stronger and to have stronger faith. I don't know. Um, but again, wanting God to answer my question on my terms is, is, is putting God in such a small view of God, of who God is. It's putting him in such a box. God's way bigger than that. Does God have to act on the terms that we set that puts God in a box, that puts him, makes him so small? Does God have to judge on our terms that puts God in such a small role? Um, does God reward people in our terms? God, look at all the great things this guy has done. Look how valuable he is to the church. Why aren't you blessing his life and making him like, why aren't you making him a rich man? Right? Why aren't you giving him nice cars to drive and stuff like that? It's such a shallow view of who God is. God can do so much more than that. But we want to we wanna put God in our own context, in our own view. And when we don't get the answers that we think can happen, the question is, do I just trust God to deal with the problem? Or do I just trust God that his righteousness, his judgment is correct? Or am I going to condemn God because he didn't solve the problem like I thought should be solved? Zach? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is what Job is doing. Yeah. But I think he wants you to come to him with his doubt. Right. And, and like, to be, it's what you do with his doubt. Like, you just like to come back to God and say, oh, he can't be God because he doesn't operate the world like I think he should. Yes. That's strong. Whereas, okay, I don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. I, you know, I have these questions about you and your righteousness and justice and everything, but I was going to throw my hands up to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very good. That's a very hugely important point. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more as we go on. But that's, that's critical is that do we allow those sufferings that we talk about, those things that don't seem right, to grow us closer to God, to be that anchor that, like, God, I don't get this. Help me understand. Like, I'm going to come to you, God, and I'm going to try to, to work through that and to grow in my, in my faith with you. Or do I let that shatter my faith? And that was the whole thing put before Job. Job, this is happening to you. Satan says it's going to shatter his faith and he's going to walk away. He's not going to serve you anymore. But yet Job has been very diligent. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand why this is happening to me. It doesn't seem right, but I'm going to, I'm going to maintain my righteousness, even though I don't understand why God is allowing this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a critical point, right? The justice he deserves. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with praying that God's justice be fulfilled, right? That God, again, God knows the situations and he knows what the right outcomes are. And it's a lot of the, a lot of times it's like I try to ask myself, just how do I stay out of the way from, from, from God's judgment? Like, like when I'm going up here to speak, how do I just not mess it up to the point that nobody understands it, right? Like, it's like I, I want, I want... I want God's justice fulfilled. I want what God wants to have happen, happen. And if that's the attitude we have, and that's what we're praying about, I think that's, that's a strong thing for us. But again, back to Zach's point, I want to use that to grow closer to God because, like, God, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why you're allowing this to happen. But there's got to be some reason. There's got to be some, something in it in how the world works that is greater than my understanding. So 
help me to understand or help me to not to be crushed by it, right? Help me to get out of the way of it. I know you want to say something, so I'll let you say. But it, but in in any case, to me, I view that as God's justice, right? Because what he's what this person is doing, whether we think they're the most evil person or not. I want God's justice to be fulfilled. And maybe God's justice is, I'm going to be really patient with that person and they're going to turn their life around and they're going to be a huge important asset to me in, in, you know, in spreading the church. I don't know that, right? I can't know that. But maybe that's God's view on it. And maybe, maybe through what that person's doing, he's going to lead hundreds of other people to Christ, right? I don't know the answer to that. All, and this is one of the common things, right? Whenever there's bad stuff happening in the world, whenever a hurricane comes through, what happens? A lot of people start praying to God, right? And they go, oh, please, you know, keep me safe. COVID happened. It made a lot of people start paying attention. Oh, you know what? I could get sick and die just like that, and I didn't even know. It's like, well, I, I need God to take care of me, right? I need something better than medicine or something, right? I, I need something more. So there's value, again, back into suffering. And how is that suffering, how do we treat it? Is it going to be instructive to us? Is it going to call our attention to those spiritual matters and wake us up, shake us a little bit? Or are we just going to ignore it? And, and I think that's a lot of those questions, you know, when we see wickedness, it's like, yeah, wickedness happens. And wickedness is always going to happen. And that's just the way the world operates. But yeah, back to a sovereign God is in charge of all this. He's not, he's not ignorant of what's going on. Every little thing that happens, God is fully aware of. He's in control. He's in control. It's, it's trust. There's certainly a message in there about trusting God for sure. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? It's all about patience. Patience. Long suffering. Yes. Yeah. Put in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think about how much harder it was for Job and Elihu not having the New Testament, right? Not not seeing that plan for that righteousness to be fulfilled. Randy. Yeah, exactly. That that peace that passes all understanding, a lot of that is just trusting God to take care of it. And that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to say, but man, is it a hard thing to do. Bob? Yeah, again, of all the things that happened to Job, God, God put the limits on Satan. You can do anything you want to him, but you can't kill him. Right? Even then, God was in control of that situation and what he allowed to have happen. Um, yeah. All right, great comments. We're going to keep going. Verse, chapter 35. Uh, we want to get through Elihu's stuff today if we can. But these are, these are great comments. Very good. Uh... Let's see, I don't really have time to read this either. Chapter 35, so this gets to Elihu's third point. He's made a couple points so far, so now we're up to his third point. Um, he brings the next uh, point by asking Job to consider if his words were right to say, verses 1 through 3. Now again, you can say he's being harsh on Job, and he's taking him out of context or putting a lot of negative connotations. But again, his issue is more of the words that have been said. And the words that have been said are a certain attitude that, that, that could be problematic. 
Um, so he asked Job if his words were right to say, and he kind of tries to turn the tables. So if there's no profit in serving God, the flip of that question is, what advantage is it to Job, um, or sorry, so, uh, so that question, what advantage is it to Job for him to delight in God and serve God? So if you're going to think about it that way, if you want to be foolish, well, if there's no profit in serving God, what profit does God get when we serve him? What does it profit God? Um, If you're going to base your life on what advantage God gives you, then consider what advantage you give God. If I'm going to serve you, God, because things are going great and you're doing great things for me, then the the flip side of that is what advantage does it give God when we do great things for him, when when we serve him that way? And back to this whole point that God doesn't owe us anything. Just because Job has been righteous does not mean that God must grant Job something. And this was, again, back to what Satan was accusing him of. And that's how we as humans like to think a lot. We think that God owes us something because we've been righteous. Look, God, I've lived my life. You know, I've, I've gone to church every Sunday. It's time you pay up. It's time you give me that thing that I want, that thing that I've been asking for. Um, it's such an such a evil way to think. Um, Elihu is asking us if we, think, uh, if we think we are doing God a favor by being righteous so that now we can put God in, in our debt to act on our terms. And a lot of times that's what we try to do. Hey, God, I'll bargain with you, right? You know, if you do this for me, guess what all these great things I'm going to do for you? Does God need us to do great things for him? Is it somehow going to benefit God? I mean, there's certainly things we can do that are useful in God's kingdom, right? Useful in serving God. But God's going to fulfill those things regardless of whether, if I choose not to help, God can find someone to do that. God can find who he needs. Um, God should act on our terms. God owes us a debt because we're good. That's, that's kind of the attitude that we want to have. And that's a very evil attitude to have. Uh, and that's what uh, verses 9 through 13 are getting at. Um, yes, sir. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That that's true. Yeah. We're, we're our our expectations for God to fulfill, you know, and if he doesn't fulfill them then he's wronged us. So God must not be righteous. That's that's very true. It's putting our our sense of righteousness above God's sense of righteousness. Um, Elihu points out the big problem. People want God to save them, but have no interest in honoring him or serving him. God, I love you if you fix my situation. If you don't fix my situation, well, I can do other things. Right? How, 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 how bad an attitude is that? How often do we have that attitude? Do we love God because, because of who God is and the grandness and the greatness of God? And we want to grow closer to God and we want to be his servants. Or do we want God because we know, well, if I get in a jam, he can bail me out, right? He'll, he'll be that magic spirit that, that fixes my, my issue. And again, this is putting God in such a small view when we do that. Um, do we serve God because we love God? Or do we serve God because we want to be comfortable? Well, if you, if you keep me happy, then I'll, I'll keep serving you, God. But just make sure I'm happy all the time. That's putting God in such a small view. Uh, everyone cries out to God in their time of trouble, but who is crying out to God for a relationship with God? And again, back to what we've read about Job, this is one, one of Job's uh, best traits, is that I don't know what's going on, God. Man, I wish my relationship with you was good. And he's, he's worried about that relationship that he has with God. He wants that relationship to be, to be good. And that's what he's most concerned about. It's not the benefits that God's given him. It's not all the things he's lost. It's that I may have lost my relationship with God. I want that fixed. Um, that's one of the things to, to Job's credit. Um, and that's what Elihu now is going to accuse him of. You should have kept crying out to God uh, for God's relationship with him and not cried out that God has been unjust in his treatment of you. Uh, instead of crying out to God properly, that idea, of, back to uh, what Daryl said about our, our opinion of righteousness, that's insulting to God. It's complaining. It's declaring that God's righteousness is, is flawed. And you cannot expect God to help you when you're attacking God. And that's the accusation made there uh, by Elihu. Uh, Verses 12 through 16. Job, you sound like the wicked when you just want God when you are in need. 
You sound like the wicked when you just want something from God, even though God gets nothing in return. Um, if you turn to God only for rescue and to bring your life back to a comfortable status, then your, your view of God is too small. God's there to give me comfort. God is there for so much more than to give you comfort. And when that's all you're depending on him for, it's such a small view of God, and you're, and you're going to be destroyed at the first suffering. Okay, anybody on chapter 36? I'm sorry, chapter 35, before we go to 36. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of what God says is going to reinforce some of these points that Elihu's making here. It's yeah. Okay, chapter thirty-six. We're going to run through this real quick in the time we have left. I hope. Uh, yeah. So, again, we don't have time to read it. I'd like to, but we're running out of time. Uh, Elihu now teaches Job that there are two options given people when they are suffering. So, this is back to, again, how do we treat suffering? We can either listen to God and serve him, or refuse to listen to God and perish. Uh, chapter 36, verses 6 through 12. It is through suffering that we have our flaws identified. It is through suffering that we see where we are not thinking and acting as God desires, at least if we're using suffering correctly. Again, the point is that suffering is reveal, reveals what we're made of. Suffering reveals our true character. Elihu says that suffering is supposed to open our ears to God in verse 15. So back to, how, what is our suffering doing for us? Hopefully it's making us listen to God more closely. That's, that's the instructive part of it. If we're suffering and we don't know why, let me talk to God about it. That's what the point Zach was bringing up before. Let me work that out with God. A similar passage in Psalm 119, verse 71. It was good for me to suffer so that I might learn your statutes. Again, back to the idea of suffering being instructive or can be instructive. So what's going to be your response to suffering is the big question. The common reaction, verses 12 through 21, is to harden your heart, right? Suffering, and you're just going to double down, and you're going to turn away from God. Well, because I didn't get what I want, I'm just going to be stubborn, and I'm not going to, go, I'm not going to look for God. I'm going to give up on God. That idea of, of, of suffering causing us to sin or suffering being our excuse to sin is a very common attitude. People harden their hearts towards God when they suffer rather than inclining their ear to the Lord. And this is the warning in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Getting back to how are we going to react to that suffering? Are we going to harden our hearts and be obstinate to God, or are we going to listen to his voice? Um, do not harden your hearts on the day of testing. Let suffering uh, be a vehicle to move you closer to God. Wicked people react to suffering by being more rebellious and continuing in their sins. The people of God humble themselves before God when they suffer. They do not cast off God, but run to God. And Job, 36, or Job chapter 36, verse 21, Take care, do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen rather than affliction. So do not sin because you're suffering. Do not choose sin just because you're being tried. And this, is a, this I think, is an, is an important point because a lot of times we want to, again, make that bargain with God. Amy, I, Amy and I were talking about this on the way here this morning. We want to make that bargain with God and that God will serve you if everything is, is great, but because things didn't turn out the way I wanted to or that one thing didn't go right, therefore you must not really be the, the, the true God. You must not be a righteous God. So now I can turn away from you. Now I, I can sin just like everybody else and see all the rewards that the wicked people are seeing on the earth because, God, you didn't hold up your bargain, right? That's what we want to put that debt in. God, you, you do this, and then I will serve you. And if you don't do it, well, then that's my excuse to, to, to betray you. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Very good. Yeah, it's about keeping that focus on God. And again, all those things that you think, well, you know, all those sufferings and rulers and things that could happen to you and, and bad, and, and God's, not, God's still going to love you just as much, right? So it's back to God can't, God's not going to leave us or abandon us, but we can certainly leave him. We can certainly separate ourselves from God. Um, yeah. Uh, do not sin because you're suffering. Do not sin when you're tried. God is your teacher, chapter 36, verse 22. Do not try to teach God. How often do we, do we get that mentality? Um, God's, God's our teacher. We shouldn't be trying to teach God. Don't try to shortcut your sufferings. That's another interesting point. Learn from God, your teacher, through your suffering. A lot of times we just want the suffering to be over. I don't necessarily want to learn the lesson. I don't necessarily want to correct my life. I just want the suffering to end, and I'm going to shortcut that however I can. Um, do not choose sin, choose God. Okay. The last part... Uh, let's see. Chapters 36 and 37. Obviously, we don't have time today. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape, though. Chapter 36, verse 24 through 37, verse 24. I'll look at that. We'll probably touch on that very briefly next week. But please go ahead and uh, read chapters 38 through 40. So chapter 38, verse 1 through chapter 40 and verse 5. So that's... Uh, God's initial um, speech, I guess, to, to Job and Job's response to that. And it's going to tie up a lot of what we talked about today. And, and, and I think the, the next couple of lessons especially are going to be really good for what we've been talking about. So any other comments? Thank you. I really appreciate it. We had good comments today. Thank you very much.